This conference will now be recorded. All right, now we're studying about viruses. Why am I showing you a situation here where the really the uh, um, pathogen is a uh, fungus and not a virus? Well, just in that, I, I want to just show you how um, when when you think of, and I'm going to show you, uh, minimize this for a moment, we'll come back to it. Um, this is a, a movie that was out quite a few years ago called The Girl with All the Gifts. It was a book and then a movie, and it was kind of like a you know scary zombie type movie, but it wasn't really very scary. But the the infection was not a virus. If you've ever watched any of these silly movies, right? They'll they'll have where it's a the zombie virus, right? Well, in this case, it was more of a zombie fungus. And what was going on is that, uh, and I the reason why I'm sharing this is because we'll be talking about rabies in a few minutes there and the rabies virus. And I wanted to show you that in this case, with the um, with this case, as far as it was a fungus, right, as the etiology, the cause of the illness for these uh, these people on this uh, wacky uh, setting and world, um, the desire was to spread this fungus to others, right? So it wasn't just a matter of trying to like uh, um, eat per se, the people as far as a zombie virus or, or some type of zombie infection would go. No, this was to actually um, bite an individual and then spread the fungus from one individual to another, which in turn could help to uh, a, mode, a mode of uh, transmission and spreading of the, uh, the fungus all throughout. And we're gonna be talking about, uh, in particular, the rabies virus. I wanna talk to you about how the mode of, uh, transport as far as this uh, that virus is concerned would be uh, through, via a bite and the transmission of this virus via the saliva in the bite transmitting the virus to the next person and so or whether it be an animal or or, or a human okay so I just thought that would be kind of interesting that uh, to seeing that there and uh, I'm sure many of you have probably seen that there let me just show you this this is quite interesting so I'm going to come back to Going to just step back for a moment. We will be looking at fungi, and so I, I want to just show you this because I think it's fascinating. Um, so in this movie, The Girl with All the Gifts, right? So it says here, uh, Dr. Cola explains to Melanie in the film, the fungus is a mutation of Orchio cordi cordyceps cordyceps unilater unilateralis unilateralis. There you go, lateralis lateralis. Yeah. A pathogenic fungus that infects insects and causes alterations in their behavior patterns, wraps around the human brain like a vine, and immediately transforms people into hungries, which will then uh, <laughs> transmit the uh, the virus here. But but this is based upon based upon something that does present itself within nature. And you'll see here, as far as um, what will happen is that this fungus found in tropical rainforests of Thailand survives by controlling carpenter ants. What happens is that a carpenter ant, right, they will be infected, foraging carpenter ant walks through the, an area of the rainforest floor infested with microscopic spores, dropped by a mature fungus. Spore excretes an enzyme that eats through the ant's exterior shell, and then what will happen is that it eventually will kill it. But now this ant has become infected, and what will occur is that the fungus consume, and, and what it will do also is that the uh, fungus within will control the ant to go to an area, look at this, um, leaves the ant colony, climbs down to a spot where humidity and temperature are optimal for the fungus to grow. The ant crawls onto a stem or the underside of a leaf, bites into its uh, main middle vein so it won't fall, and then it dies. So it's securing itself, and the fungus is manipulating to get to the optimal environment for growth. So then what goes on? The fungus consumes the ant's internal organs using its shell as a protective casing. The fungus main stem, called the stroma, erupts from the back of the ant's head and grows. Here's the stroma. Now look at this here as far as what's going to happen. The mature fungus releases spores from its stroma. Okay, uh, They fall to the ground, creating a 10 square feet killing zone, which will attack new ants and allow the cycle to continue and allow the spread of the fungus uh, to, to carry on. Um, I don't know about you, but I think that's fascinating. Sad for the ant, but part of the whole life cycle of what goes on as far as the uh, circle of life. And here we have the interaction between plant life and, and uh, the animal kingdom. Quite fascinating. All right, so let's move that 
for a moment here. We're going to go now and start with our PowerPoint. Okay, so we're going to look at our PowerPoint and begin with this here. We won't finish the PowerPoint today, uh, but we'll go on and look at a good amount of material today reviewing regarding viruses. Okay, so let's start off with here. Excellent. So what, when I think of, of viruses, I think of um, really, I, I put, I added this here, folks, and you should do that also. I think of an infectious particle. Okay, that's that's just the term that immediately when I think virus, I think infectious particle. Okay, and, and realizing that, so you'll see here as far as this infectious particle, so that it has the ability to infect cells, right? And it has the ability to hijack. So I I, I also use the term infectious particle, and I think of also the term hijack. Okay, it's not a it's not a technical term, <clears throat> right? But when I'm thinking about what's taking place with the virus, what does it do? It actually hijacks the mechanisms of whatever cell it's infecting, right? Or, uh, yeah, in the case of whether it's a bacteria or whether it's a eukaryotic cell, prokaryotic cell, doesn't matter, right? And it hijacks the mechanisms that are present within that cell in order to uh, spread and to reproduce, okay? Because the virus itself does not have that, that ability to do that on its own. But what it does have the ability to do is it does have, right? So you'll see here that um, small biological particle, it's not really considered living per se. It can't be defined as being alive at the cellular level because it 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 doesn't have organelles present. It does have um, genetic material. So it consists of, so you'll see here a viral particle, virion, uh, consists of DNA or RNA, whether they're double-stranded or single-stranded, all right, just for you to know, primarily when you're thinking of eukaryotic cell for a human, we're thinking of a, a double-stranded DNA and a single strand of RNA, okay? But in the case of the viruses, they can have double or single-strand DNA or RNA, okay? and surrounded by this protein coat, this protective covering, this protective protein coat, this capsid that will keep the genetic material safe. Right. In order then once the virus infects a cell in order to be able to release that genetic material into the uh, the hijacked cell and uh, allow for it to be re reproduced. So you'll see here as far as uh, the genetic material, the genome that's present can be double stranded, single stranded, like I said, DNA, RNA. OK, um, the viruses have the genes encoded proteins of their capsid so that they can actually create this capsid, this covering of the uh, genetic material, the genome. Okay? And um, you'll see here that proteins also that make them pathogenic to their hosts. And this is the deal is that understand that a virus is not having a positive relationship primarily. Okay. Now, there are certain situations where we can have, as far as we, we looked at um, last chapter, we were looking at the termites and how the, the benefits of, right, with the uh, the bacterium that can be present within the gut in order to allow them to be able to digest cellulose, to digest uh, material, plant material in order for the uh, termite to be alive, right? Well, we also have this symbiotic relationship with bacteria uh, in order for us to be able to have uh, the ability to be have a healthy digestive system and, and also the integument on our integument and many other areas of the body in order to protect us from getting uh, sick from pathogenic bacteria. We have healthy bacteria making up comprising our uh, microbiome. But we're talking about viruses, pathogenic, their negative effects to the uh, to the body. They are not living, having a symbiotic relationship with us, okay? Uh, some contain enzymes for viral genome replication and others for attacking cell walls of membranes, right? So the different types of uh, mechanisms that are present in order to allow for infection to take place of uh, healthy cells. I just provided this here just to give you a little bit of just a review over the next couple of slides regarding genomics, regarding um, the genetic material present. And here we're looking at as far as for DNA and the, the nucleotide bases and the pairs that take place. Um, you'll see as we unravel the gene and we're taking it, looking at the, the different proteins that are present that comprise uh, the DNA and also the RNA. Now, RNA would have uh, uracil and not thymine present as far as one of the base pairs. But you'll see here as far as we unravel, and you'll see here that this is what comprises the chromosomes that are present and that during prophase, so prophase is the first stage of uh, mitosis. 
and cellular division will take place of primarily all the eukaryotic cells in our body except for uh, the ones that are involved in our gametes, right? The sex cells, the egg and the sperm. Right? Here you're seeing as far as the donation that occurs. So the, the uh, sperm and the egg are haploid. So they have half the genetic material present. And you'll see here as far as and they're donating this, the mother and the father donating this to the child. And so this will comprise the, the, the offspring's genome and will allow phenotypically, right? So genotypically we have what's going on here as far as the DNA is concerned. Phenotypically, what's the presentation as far as control of uh, whether someone can be short or tall, uh, whether we have uh, different uh, eye colors, hair color, skin color, right? All this presentation of melanin present within the body, uh, different pathologies and diseases that we could be more susceptible to, right? We, we'll talk about the BRCA um, uh, gene and such and how that can uh, allow for someone to be uh, susceptible to, uh, more susceptible to breast cancer than others, right? Um, so this is what's going on as far as the genes are concerned. Um, protein synthesis, the, the recipe for uh, protein synthesis, that's what's taking place with uh, the DNA. And here you see uh, the genome, the 23 pairs of chromosomes. And you'll see that here as far as for the uh, actual sexual determination of the human, we have here an XY, so we have here a uh, male. Right, and so again, one pair, one half, one set, 23 chromosomes donated from mom, donated from dad, creating a uh, diploid, a full 23 pairs of chromosomes. Now, here I gave you this image here, and and you'll see here as far as where it says spherical. Know that that can also be in your PowerPoint uh, noted as enveloped, enveloped, enveloped. All right, because you're seeing here that what the membranous envelope present here, okay? So know that uh, spherical can also be called the envelope type virus. And as far as these types are concerned, we have helical, polyhedral, spherical, aka envelope, and complex, right? And what will happen, folks, and, and know this, that uh, we will take next class and take some time and discuss as far as uh, what's taking place with uh, COVID-19. And we'll, we'll talk about the virus and such. And uh, we'll talk about even just uh, some of the issues that are going on um, as far as vaccines and such. And so we'll, we'll talk and discuss this, okay? Uh, so let's take a look here and see that we have this helical presentation. We have the polyhedral presentation. So they're all very unique as far as in their, uh, in their morphology, we would say, as far as these viruses are concerned. Now know that the viruses are very, very small in comparison to a bacteria because know that we have these bacteriophages see this complex type of virus here the bacteriophage this will actually infect uh, these bacteria these uh, prokaryotic cells okay so and you'll see that we have the genetic material present whether it's RNA or DNA RNA DNA RNA DNA right the genetic material is present it's protected until there's the time where it will then infect um, this infectious particle, this virus, will hijack, will infect uh, some type of uh, cell. So you'll see here as far as uh, in the helical structure, right? So the helical viruses, these proteins are uh, assembled in a rod-like spiral around the genome, around the genetic material. And again, this would be the RNA, right? And you'll see here that a number of viruses that infect plant cells would be considered helical. And so tobacco, a mosaic, vi mosaic virus. And we, I provided for you here a picture of how this uh, can affect uh, tobacco and such, right? And so you can see here as far as the presentation doesn't look good as far as the destruction of, and this is, and this is just an example, but showing you that, and this can get worse. This does get worse for the plant and destroy the leaves of the uh, tobacco plant, okay? Now, whatever your thoughts are on smoking and such, I mean, we all know that it's not healthy for you and such, but just to see that, you know, so someone is trying to uh, grow this and sell this. And, and so, you know, understand that um, they are trying to do all that they can to protect their crops and their livelihood. And, and again, I, you know, I'm not gonna make a moral decision regarding it. I just know that it's not healthy and doesn't produce positive circumstances down the road. So uh, we've, we've had uh, both my wife and my, Self, uh, our sides of the, each sides of the family have had unfortunately um, family members that have died as a result of uh, lung cancer. So, yeah, not good things. And I've and and folks, I've had patients um, 
that I've taken care of that have developed lung cancer. I've had patients with um, uh, COPD and emphysema, so emphysema, chronic bronchitis, and uh, to see them suffer with their ability to breathe, to take every breath, that's a very sad thing and, and correlated with um, smoking for many, many years and such. So, yeah. But just seeing here as far as then this tobacco mosaic virus, it's a helical type of a virus. Okay? And so again, you're seeing here as far as the RNA present and protected by the capsid uh, protein there. Polyhedral viruses. These are interesting looking, right? So this, uh, the example would be the adenovirus. So uh, you'll see here as far as triangular units in a iso icosahedral structure, right? Um, protein spikes that provide host cell recognition. So here's the deal, right? So that um, cell to cell recognition is a big deal as far as our immune systems are concerned. So if we recognize, if we, if our immune system is really scanning and looking for cells that are non-self, we have present on our cell membranes of our cells of our body, uh, the ability, the signature to see that, hey, our immune system looks at it, a cell and goes, hey, that's self, that, that's us, we're good, we're not gonna attack it. Unless a patient suffers from some type of autoimmune disorder and then it'll start attacking specific areas of the body that would be considered, that are self, but considered non-self, according to the autoimmune disease and then start destroying. So say in the case of, uh, um, we're looking at um, multiple sclerosis and attacking the, uh, the myelin producing uh, cells present, the support cells, the glial cells present within the central nervous system, which would be the oligodendrocytes. So here we have, as far as the polyhedral viruses, the adenovirus. And here you're, you're seeing as far as an example of the polyhedral virus and the DNA protected by the capsid uh, protein here. As far as uh, enveloped viruses, AKA the spherical viruses, right? So here you see an example would be, uh, and the RNA, the genetic material, the genome is protected by the uh, membranous envelope, okay? The capsid is present here, and then there's a membranous envelope protecting the capsid, okay? That protein there protecting the genome. So we have here herpes virus, uh, the flu virus. These would be uh, the types of viruses that would be presenting and have this uh, morphology, this presentation. And so here you're looking at the herpes virus and one example of a general herpes virus because there are multiple types and we'll talk about that in just a moment. You'll see here that we have these, um, and it's quite complex actually folks, right? So you'll see here, as far as the, the DNA present, you'll have the capsid proteins, and then you'll have the envelope present. And this envelope is a phospholipid here, right? Do you see that in the orange? Okay. In addition to these protein spikes that are uh, emanating off of the membrane. You'll see here, as far as then there are bacteriophages, and I said to you that bacteriophages are the types of virus, these viral particles, these, these infectious particles that will infect, in particular, these prokaryotes, these bacteria, okay? And they're very like science fiction looking, like, aren't they? Um, complex viruses, that's what they're called, uh, with a, a tail attached to a polyhedral head. Um, and you'll see here as far as what's taking place as far as the head and the tail. And then these, uh, I mean, it does look like something out of science fiction when you think about it. Um, protected right, by the uh, protein capsid here. And we see here as far as the DNA is present within. So, and we're gonna look at uh, examples of, in the presentation, in just a few minutes as far as going over. Uh, I'm gonna show you that, we'll come back to classification in just one moment, but I wanna show you that. I'm not gonna ask you to memorize this, okay? So you're not gonna have to memorize these charts right here, see these, right? These specific, Parts and such, you're not going to have to process that, folks. But what I am going to ask you to do is there are certain uh, types of viruses that you will have to uh, know and commit to memory for uh, this chapter, okay? All right, let's go back to classification here. Okay, so you'll see here that virus is classified by the International Committee on Taxonomy. Um, you, right, we know that we have what? Domain kingdom, phylum, 
class, order, family, genus, species, right? So we have here, as far as into orders, families, genera, and species, right? So the genus and the species. And so this is what the name will be of specific types of viruses and such will be comprised of the genus and the species. So size and structure is part of the classification, type and number of nucleic uh, acid molecules, right? So whether we have a single strand, double strand, uh, method of replication inside the host uh, cells, as far as we, we're going to be looking at and talking about that a little bit today. Um, host range, right? And the infective cycle. And we're going to look at, in particular, I'm going to take a little bit more time and look at um, rabies, the rabies virus in particular, and uh, discuss with you a little bit more information regarding that. Um, look at this here, folks. More than 4,000 species of viruses are classified into more than 80 families. So that's quite a bit. That's that's quite a an expansive number of viruses that are present in our environment that we live in. And, and know that there are mutations of these viruses. There are variations of these viruses and such. So usually a virus will infect a single species or a close, closely related species, right? Affecting either just an organ system. So like in the case of, say, um, we're thinking of uh, the herp, um, herpes zoster, okay? And we're looking at um, as far as uh, chickenpox and shingles, okay? Infecting the body, causing a presentation, outward presentation of uh, of different types of little pustules and such throughout the body and laying dormant within the nervous system, okay? Um, single tissue or cell type. So this is really what, like, like there's a focus taking place with uh, each of the particular types of viruses. Um, these 21 viral families that include viruses that cause human diseases, so AIDS, encephalitis. So this would be an inflammation of the uh, nervous system. Uh, yellow fever, smallpox, uh, we'll discuss some of these, not yellow fever in particular, but we'll discuss uh, some of these different um, pathologies and diseases that occur. Um, you'll see here also that we talked about the bacteriophage briefly and how that will be infecting, have the ability to infect bacteria, right? Uh, animals and plants, we just looked at as far as uh, the fungus was concerned, but we'll also look at as far as with the, uh, with the plants, we looked at that tobacco virus that was present. And we'll see as far as uh, rabies is concerned in particular one. So an animal will be a vector which will transmit the rabies virus to the human, whether it could be a dog, primarily it's dogs, but also could be a bat, could be other types of uh, animals that transmit. Um, also, how about um, skunks, uh, raccoons can transmit uh, the rabies virus via bite to a human. So we'll see here as far as the herpes virus is concerned, so I'm going to focus on that right here. And also you'll see here as far as the virus families, right? So let's go back out of here for a moment. So you'll see here that these families, and back one more, so they're classified order, family, genus, and species, right? So we have there these 21 viral families that can cause human illness. And that's what our real focus is for as far as uh, virus is concerned. Yes, we'll mention regarding uh, plants, We'll mention regarding animals and such, but primarily I'm going to focus on for my class, for what I want you all to know, would be for viruses that can affect humans and what kind of, uh, what where they would present and how they would make us sick. So you'll see here as far as then the uh, hepato adna viridae, right, for hepatitis B. And there are multiple hepatitises that can uh, affect uh, the liver in particular and make you uh, quite sick, right? Um, and some you can, you get, you can actually, as far as uh, the hepatitis are concerned, some are not as uh, uh, virulent as others, as far as making you extremely sick and, and uh, eventually leading to, uh, possibly leading to your death. Um, others you can recuperate from. Uh, so you can go over that and we will discuss some of that. As far as herpes simplex is concerned, you'll see here, so you're all familiar with the cold sore. You all have heard of, I'm sure, genital herpes. So know that it's a different strain of the herpes virus. So herpes simplex one for oral herpes, which produces cold sores, or herpes simplex two, which is genital herpes, which produces sores in the genital region, right? Um, I mentioned to you already, as far as varicella is concerned, regarding chicken pox, and what'll happen with chicken pox as far as um, you'll go through the cycle of the presentation of chicken pox. So I had it when I was five years old, one of the last few days of kindergarten, 
for me, I started kindergarten a little bit later. I was my birthday's in January and so on and so forth. Anyway, <laughs> I was at the end of my kindergarten year, right before summertime, uh, summer break. Um, I ended up getting chicken pox from uh, being at school from one of the kids. And as such, I spent, uh, you know, a couple weeks there with uh, presenting with these little pustules on my body. And uh, it wasn't any fun. It was itchy and, you know, slept a lot. Then what will happen is that chicken pox can lay dormant. And when your immune system is compromised, is weakened, then it quite possibly could uh, present itself in the form of an area uh, called a, um, well, let me, let me, let's just show you here for here. So that would be shingles. And this information first, this uh, image, and then I'll show you as far as the dermatome that is concerned that can be any throughout the body, really. And let's look at the cold sores first. So you see here, stage one to stage five, as far as the healing stage. So from uh, noticing that there's some tingling, itching, or burning, uh, then you get a little bit of a blister formation. Uh, you'll see here the blister bursts, scab formation, which can look pretty gnarly, uh, understood. And that's a uh, and you know this can happen as a result of um, if someone has uh, a presentation of these of any type of uh, oral herpes or simplex one, and you kiss that person, this is how you transfer that from one to another. Okay. As far as chicken pox and shingles, so you'll see here first exposure to varicella zoster, the virus there, you'll present with these chicken pox throughout the body, and some people present with a mild case. Some people present with a very, with a, you know, mild, moderate, severe, the terms that we use in healthcare as far as uh, the presentation of whatever type of uh, illness it may be. So uh, full body rash, highly contagious. And I don't remember, I'd have to look as far as, but it's within a, you know, like a, within a relative like five day period where they're contagious with a, a person who has initially had the uh, outbreak, they're contagious and then, um, you know, it takes a couple of weeks to go away. Uh, common in children, um, live virus vaccine in order to uh, uh, it really expose a person to the virus via vaccine so that they can then also then fight the disease. Now, there are also um, attenuated vaccines that are, and, and really what goes on is that it's it's live, but it, it's not, it's, it's really um, diminished as far as its virulence. So it quite possibly could cause an outbreak. Right there is a there is a there is the possibility, but usually it just produces just a mild immune response, and so that your body is is exposed to the uh, virus, it mounts an immune response because our body has the mechanisms in order to handle viruses, right? And then uh, and then uh, provide uh, the ability to have this uh, um, you know defense against the varicella virus. Now in the case of shingles, so someone has a case of chicken pox, then what will happen is that the reactivation of the varicella zoster virus, and I'm going to show you in just a moment in an image here that I added later on, so you can, uh, I'll repost this at the end of the, uh, on Wednesday there. Um, you'll see here as far as it lays dormant within an area of the spine, in particular the dorsal root ganglion. So this would be, the dorsal root is the posterior aspect of uh, an extension of the spinal cord, and I'll show you an image in just a moment. But then what will happen is that each of these levels of the spinal nerves, they're bilateral coming off of the spine, will have a presentation, an area of the skin that they are uh, innervating, okay? And so what will happen is that then this, this virus that's been reactivated as a result of a compromised immune system will then allow for it to present along the dermatome. So let me just show you here. Let's So, so let's look at dermatomes here for a moment. Oh, let's see how this one looks. <clears throat> yeah, okay, this one's good. And those of you that have had anatomy and physiology already are familiar with this. But those of you that have not, I'll give you a little bit of an, some input here. So take a look here and you'll see that we have 
as far as now C1 does not have a dermatome, but cervical, the first cervical vertebra. But you'll see here as far as C2, which actually exits below um, C1. And so and I'm not going to go over the whole presentation. Just know that um, bilaterally, C2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8, right? These areas here are innervated by the nerve roots. And let's just show you what a nerve root is. Very good. So let's see here. Okay, so at each level, so here's the spinal cord, okay? And what'll take place is that at each level, folks, at each level, we have these actual nerve roots, right here, spinal nerve, right here. They're created by these dorsal and ventral, posterior, and anterior. So this is the anterior of the spine. The posterior of the spine, if you feel down the center of your spine, you'll feel these little bumps. That's the spinous processes that's peeking out right here, right? This little piece right here. But at each of the levels of the spine, there'll be a space here. It's called the intervertebral foramen, the IVF, right? And what'll happen is that it's created by the vertebra above and be up below that hole. And that's where we have this spinal nerve root come out. And then we have here the extension, and it's going to go to innervate, send messages to, and re receive input from um, an area of the skin. Okay. And again, it's bilateral, it's on both sides. And you'll see here again uh, posterior, dorsal, anterior, ventral spinal cord. Okay. So let's go back to our dermatome chart here. And what you're seeing here again is that, so all these levels, so T1 through T12 in the blue here, and many times the presentation for shingles would be in a dermatome in the thoracic region, but it can be also on the face and in the uh, arms, but primarily it's, the, it's really in the dorsal region here as far as in the, the thoracic region. And you can have it on one of these bands, and usually folks know that it's uh, an image where it kind of like crosses over into multiple levels, okay? And so it can be, you know, through in here, on one sided, right, on one side. And so what we're looking at, let's see here, okay. So I posted an image here also. So we'll see here as far as a localized rash, okay? And this can, this post herpetic neuralgia can be a lingering type of symptom afterwards that can be quite painful for a long period of time. So this image here just shows you that Here's the posterior aspect, the dorsal region. And what happens with the spinal cord is that um, sensory input comes through the, the ventral region, the anterior, right? Through this portion of the root, the ventral root. The dorsal root actually has motor output. So motor output. So when the brain and the spinal cord are sending information to the musculature or to the dermatome, um, that's what's going on as far as the, uh, so the sensory input from the dermatome travels through the ventral root, and then as far and pain and discomfort can travel through that ventral root and from that those areas. Very uncomfortable, folks. And so this uh, dorsal root ganglion, this area where a nerve cell body is present, it's going to have the dormant virus present. And when your immune system is weakened, it'll present itself along the dermatome, right? So whether it's one-sided or bilateral right? Um, really a rough, rough type of, uh, uh, I don't, let me, uh, let me minimize this for a moment. Let me stop sharing. Has anyone had uh, family members or someone you know suffer from uh, shingles? Or has anybody ever had chicken pox? Your mom, yeah. So primarily, really, so understand that, you know, so I'm 57. So, uh, you know, like, so I'm older. So we, there wasn't a, a, a vaccine that back then. So uh, parents would primarily just, you know, like they they didn't, they figured, well, that let the kid get it when they're young, but not realizing that as we get older and it lays dormant within, you know, you could present with this shingles. And my father 
uh, presented with shingles, oh, I'm going to say about 12, 15, 12 to 15 years ago, and it was pretty rough stuff. Okay, so Rook, sorry, you had uh, shingles. Uh, you had uh, chicken pox, sorry. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, so it's not a fun thing. And, and I have to tell you, the chicken pox, yes, understood, yes. Uh, the chicken pox, it's rough, but the shingles are really, um, really can be like very, very uncomfortable, very painful as far as their presentation is concerned. Yeah, yeah. So many times when you hear people complaining of, that they've experienced or are experiencing shingles, and if they and if they catch it and diagnose it early, there there are antivirals that they can give that can help to manage it and and uh, really help to diminish its presentation. Um, but if they don't catch it early enough, it's not going to make an impact, and so the patient will have to suffer through. And this suffering can last for weeks, folks. So shingles can be a very nasty. So I, I'm going to, uh, I've been looking into getting the uh, actual shingles uh, vaccine myself, uh, you know, having had chicken pox when I was a young, young person. So, all right. Yeah, thank you for your input there, folks. Yeah, it's just, it's shingles is just, uh, it's something you really don't wish on anyone. It's just terrible. All right, so let's go back to our PowerPoint here. Okay. And again, as I as I mentioned to you before, there I'm not asking you to give me this information. I kept it here, folks, because I just want you to, to see that depending upon the uh, so let's go back here for a moment. So depending upon the uh, family, right? The family and the presentation as far as also you're seeing here. Uh, knowing that single stranded or double stranded, as far as the uh, genome is concerned for the virus, it's just giving that to you here just so that you can see that. Um, I'm going to go over a couple of slides that I've posted here in the PowerPoint, right? As far as warts are concerned, as far as smallpox, we're going to look at parvovirus and we'll go from there. So let's take a look here. And so here we have, and this was uh, posted by someone on the web there as far as looking as far as did you understand or realize that warts are as a result of a the etiology would be a virus okay i don't know if you you knew that um when i wasn't in healthcare and didn't do any studying along those lines i had no idea that it was as a result of a wart um i have had um just warts on my fingers a couple of warts here and there over the years um also i've had a plantar wart on the sole of my foot and let me tell you that can be a very terrible uncomfortable painful uh, wart experience and there's also other types of warts that you'll see here as far as presentation is concerned as far as treatment is concerned so i actually i had what and this was going back many years as far as with, for the plantar wart uh the doctor actually used um heat instead of cryotherapy they he used a, a heat instrument in order to burn the uh the wart off of my foot and that, that was after you know injecting some type of analgesic but i can tell you that that was pretty not so cool <laughs> that was because even with the analgesic it wore off kind of quickly before he was still done because there there can be kind of like roots to the wart um and so it can penetrate deep into the integument and such and you really have to make sure that you get that in order to really take care of the wart um, so you can either freeze it, you can use chemicals, which are weak acids that can work at um, removal of the wart. Uh, electro desiccation, so using electrical current to burn and scrape away the surface of the wart, or laser as far as destroying uh, the root of the wart. And like I said to you, that it does have a root there, and so it's important to make sure that you uh, are handling that and getting to the actual root so that it doesn't re reoccur. Right? You'll see here as far as uh, the uh, human papillo, papillovirus. So this is the HPV, the virus that is the uh, etiology for warts and such. And you'll see here as far as, so um, the strain here, so different strains, right? We talk about different strains of these uh, viruses. So you'll see here as far as these strains uh, will be responsible for 70% of the cases of cervical cancer, right? And uh, so cancers of the anus, the vagina, the vulva. And so for those that are sexually active and they can transmit the HPV virus to each other, you'll see here as far as uh, examples of the couples and such. And so the possibility of, so this is why they talk about getting the HPV uh, vaccine and such, okay? Um, 
but you know and so what is one way that you would prevent getting this would be to not be sexually active and then when you do have time to find it, someone who's going to be your long-term partner uh, then you both don't have it and then you don't have to worry about it but you know the reality of of unfortunately of life is that um, people are sexually active and so things happen and occur so there are these vaccine the vaccine is present in order to uh, help as far as prevention um, you'll see here not covered by vaccination so other strains that cause about 30 percent of the cervical cancer so the cervix is the actual opening of the uterus and so the cervix stays closed when the patient is pregnant and uh, is developing a child within the uterus and then the cervix will dilate at the time of uh, delivery you'll see here as far as low risk hbv strains so responsible 90 percent of the cases of genital warts and i have to tell you folks um, as far as you know my studies and such to see um, you know looking at images of different types of pathology for many many years as far as teaching this class and as well as uh, in my training for uh, graduate school and such um, genital warts so you just think maybe there's one or two but there can be presentations folks of many throughout the whole area that area of the body as far as the uh, external genitalia of the male and the female and it can be a devastating thing for a patient folks because they can remove them surgically remove them but they can they'll come back and such and so genital warts can be a terrible terrible um, illness for someone to experience and to have okay? and then there are other low risk HPV strains again that can clear the infection by itself the younger you are and the faster it clears up but that's you know for the low risk but there are other strains that can really lead to uh, some pretty catastrophic types of uh, presentation here we have smallpox and so you're familiar with smallpox as far as uh, in particular probably uh, in your studies of uh, american history and how uh, smallpox was brought over uh, from uh, europe and such to the united states and and many people in the uh, uh, native americans ended up getting very sick and dying and so uh, many many people died as a result of the spread of smallpox throughout the United States in the early stages of um, you know the United States and such and so very very sad folks because they weren't they weren't exposed to it prior to uh, and so high fever headache backache rash sores blisters fatigue and this can lead to death if it present if the uh, if the patient does not have the ability to fight off uh, the infection parvovirus so this is quite interesting as far as what takes place with parvovirus so a dog becomes a parvo carrier okay so the dog becomes a parvo carrier let's see how it happens the carrier dog excretes the virus in its feces another dog ingests the virus through the oral nasal route because know that folks the the, the amount of um, sensory input from their sense of smell right in comparison to and a, a human sense of smell is like off the charts. So like we have, so comparison wise, so I, I, I've read this before that, um, so for the human, it's about the size of a quarter as far as our area of um, sensory receptors present within the nasal cavity, as far as that can intake um, these different olfactorants, right? Smells. Well, in the case of dogs, it's like, you know, double that or more okay um even like to this I've, oh wait you know what yeah it's the size of like a dinner plate as far as receptor wise is concerned in comparison as far as percentage wise so like a little dog is not going to have that but still know that that little dog still has more ability we have a little five pound doggy and she has more um, of a sensory input as this little tiny dog than i do as a full-grown human adult but know that this is how they communicate with each other and they're able to figure out different things regarding the sense of smell. So another dog will ingest the virus through, right? Either putting its nose to, you know, anal region or or actually, you know, you've had dogs eat poop. I mean, I don't like to say that it happens, but it does. And so the virus multiplies in the dog's intestines and then and this dog then will be a carrier. And what'll happen is that, right? So you can have treatment or the treatment can work out well or not so well. And this can lead to the death of the dog. And, and as far as the full presentation, yeah and, and you know what too um brian courses I, I understood also rabbits and in particular like baby rabbits will eat their own poop eat their poop of their mother 
in order to help with some of the bacteria and nutrients that can be present as the babies get older. Yeah, it's weird. My, my daughter raises rabbits and such. <laughs> it's just like, oh, what are you doing? <laughs> this is just the, the normal, uh, what goes on with their uh, you know, development and such. And so again, you'll see here as far as now, here's a single stranded. So uh, we'll take a look at uh, Ebola, dengue fever. We'll look at it, the flu, measles and mumps. So let's take a look at some of these here. So Ebola virus, right? The Ebola virus, highly deadly, hemorrhagic fever virus resulting in a systemic viral infection throughout the body. So, so not just infecting just one area of the body, but really systemically affecting. So I said to you earlier there in the presentation, I said that primarily, Viruses can affect a certain system, organ system, uh, a tissue and such, uh, but some can be you know, systemic, right? And so the virus first attacks white blood cells, the leukocytes, then infiltrates nearly every type of cell in the body. And so here's the deal, attacking the white blood cells, these white blood cells are involved in your uh, specific immune response. And so having a specific immune response present uh, within your body, that, that ruins your um, really, diminishes your immune response and can lead you also to uh, get illness and sickness from other types of um, bacterium and viruses that you normally wouldn't get sick from as a result of your immune system being compromised, we would say, not functioning like it properly should. Believe that uh, fruit bats inhabiting West African forests and are the natural host for the virus. Um, crazy stuff, right? So we can either, you know, get it as a vector from animals or through each passing it on from each other, from human to human, Ebola virus. Dengue fever, right? So here's another one. And know that many of these, so with the coronavirus, right? We know that, we, what do they do when you come into a building if they wanna make kind of do one type of check? They'll check your temperature because a, a virus will initiate the immune response. And part of the immune response is to do what? Is to have an increase in temperature. Okay, which will allow for, uh, really, it should allow for um, the body to body's immune system, your immune system, to function optimally, and also to help to really diminish the virulence of the virus that's present within. Okay, so that's why fever is what how you present with. So high fever, and so high fever can really be very detrimental to the human, and that it can cause damage to the brain, to the central nervous system, brain, spinal cord, and uh, and lead to destruction of those areas. So know that if I if I add heat uh, to a protein, so if I cook an egg, I put it on the stove, I add heat to it, you cook the protein, you denature the protein, you change the presentation. Well, denaturing proteins within the body can lead to brain damage, can lead to damage of other tissues. Not good, you know, long-term. Short-term, fever is a good thing. Long-term can be bad. Uh, let's see here, as far as, the, the lymph, no, lymph glands, lymph nodes. So these are the areas of uh, the immune system, lymphatic system that work to sequester any type of viruses or uh, bacteria or any type of pathogens that can make you sick and allow for then uh, your immune system to attack and destroy and, and to in inactivate, okay? Um, can lead to muscle and joint pain, uh, nosebleeds, uh, abdominal pain, excessive vomiting. These can be all types of uh, uh, signs and symptoms that can really uh, lead to a uh, catastrophic uh, end. You see here, prevention tips. Uh, and so look at as far as mosquitoes breed in standing water. So eliminate any standing water in and around your house. Know that as a vector, right, as the, the mode of transmission of this virus from to, to you, to a human, mosquitoes are involved in transferring and as a vector, we call it, um, many different illnesses to mankind. And so really, honestly, mosquitoes are just like the devil. They are just, it's bad stuff, man. Mosquitoes are not positive in any way. And please, when you go out, as it gets nice out in the springtime and in the summer, make sure that you're, you know, you wear longer sleeves, longer pants, um, spray on your clothes. It's better to spray on your clothes than it is on you as a person, uh, the different uh, repellents. I have to tell you that because these repellents, you know, some of them can be very, they're, they're nasty chemicals. And so, yes, there are natural ones out there, whatever it may be, however your thoughts are on 
using chemicals or natural chemicals or artificial, whatever it may be, use some type of repellent and protect yourself as far as wearing protective clothing, having screens up in your house in order to make sure that you are preventing yourself from getting uh, bit by a mosquito. Okay, and know that it's really it's the it's the primarily it's the female that as a result of uh, being pregnant and and having the eggs present that. Um, you know, having these eggs present that she needs to feed, she will then seek uh, biting a mammal in order to get blood in order to feed her eggs and such. Yeah, so it's crazy stuff. Um, look at this, use guppy fish in swimming pools. And so these guppies can then in the standing, in the, in the water there, that's quite interesting. I've never heard of that. <laughs> that's wild. Um, but there are chemicals also present within swimming pools, but they, and there's also the fact that it's circulating the water. Any type of stagnant water is never, standing water, never a good thing. Thank you, Phoebe. Now here we have, as far as cold, so let's take a look for a moment as versus flu. So let me just show you here, as far as, we'll come back to this image in just one moment. So you hear as far as the influenza, the flu virus, right? So single-stranded RNA. Now let's go to, cold rhinovirus right so different types of viruses okay and but here this is a big deal as far as trying to understand so what am i experiencing right now is it the flu or is it the is it a cold is it the, the rhinovirus so as far as fever is concerned you know you see here as far as the and this this is like a great little short little small little image that you can have that you can go to and go back to and save and put on whatever but just to see that uh, some of the differences between, or, you know, like just look it up on your phone. <laughs> you know, I mean, we have our phones with us all the time, but seeing how, yeah, in the case of influenza, you know, there's usually a temperature present, okay? As far as fatigue is concerned, flu really has severe fatigue, okay? And body aches. Whereas for a cold, usually, yeah, maybe mild, but the flu really, the flu is a, a more extreme type of a virus that can really make you quite sick and can kill those that have immune systems that are compromised or our older patients, our older pop, our geriatric population. You'll see here as far as also uh, chills and shivering, uh, moderate to severe as far as the flu. So just give you a little bit of input regarding you knowing the difference between these two types of viruses and the different presentations of these uh, variants of these viruses. You'll see here as far as, and this is why each year, right, with the flu virus, um, there's a new stra there are new strains, and so they create the flu vaccine from the previous season's um, virus. That's flu virus that seems to be the most uh, virulent and such. Um, you'll see here as far as measles are concerned. So there are measles, there are German measles. So measles, you're thinking of some type of rash type of presentation. Okay, and again, look at here as far as high fever. Also know that and understand that. Um, children seem to present with higher, they're able to present with and tolerate higher temperatures. Um, but again, we have to be very careful that that temperature can go, can can rapidly increase. And when it gets, you know, 104 is dangerous, folks. 104 is a dangerous level. And really, you are not to uh, give them aspirin or ibuprofen uh, with any type of high temperature because this can lead to other uh, uh, damaging Ill, um, effects to the central nervous system, brain damage and such. Um, cough, runny nose, red watery eyes, rash breaks out three to five days after symptoms begin um, can be very serious, folks. So one out of four people who get measles will be hospitalized. 25%, that's, that's quite a number, folks. One out of every 1,000 people with measles will develop brain swelling, right? This encephalitis, um, which may lead to brain damage. Not good high fever brain damage possibility. One or two out of 1,000 people with measles will die, even with the best care. And that's sad, right? That's sad. So the MMR vaccine here, as far as measles, mumps, rubella, ger uh, German measles, right? Um, yeah, I believe that's what it is, um, will then cover these patients with. Now, I have to tell you something, right, as far as vaccines are concerned. So I'm not anti-vax understand that. Chiropractors still, you know, I'm still um, think that there's that medicine and um, and and healthcare, natural healthcare can work together, okay? But I, uh, but I am wise about, and we have been wise about, um, 
spreading out our vaccines for our children and such. And they've not gotten all the vaccines, I have to tell you also. So we've chosen that. And that's just our personal opinion and, and our thoughts regarding our own family. But I would tell you that um, getting multiple vaccines, now this is one shot with these, but getting multiple shots and vaccines at one time in a little young person, um, for me, it just seems like for an immature immune system, um, you have to be very careful. And so do your research, look into that. I've done my research for my family and such, and we've tried to do all that we can to be safe about um, you know, making sure how we spread out our vaccines for the children so that they are that they're as safe as possible for them. Put it that way. So you have to do that for your own self and for your own family and uh, look into that. You know? I would. As far as mumps are concerned, you'll see here with mumps, uh, so affecting the salivary glands. So you have here the parotid, you have here the uh, sublingual and the submandibular uh, glands here as far as these glands and they're bilateral both sides. And this is the duct for their tubes that will allow for the, the uh, sending of the saliva uh, to the oral cavity, right? Now, so this area here, this myxovirus, this mumps virus will attack and, and will lead to, in particular, the parotid gland from getting very swollen and such. I don't know if I have, let me see if I can show you an image of. My dad had mumps when he was a kid and he's 79 now years old. So yeah, so here you'll see, look at this poor child, right? So that's uncomfortable folks, that's very uncomfortable. Here we go again. That's quite a bit of swelling, folks, edema. See, quite a bit. Oh, yeah, if it looks painful, you gotta know that, that it is it is quite painful, right? All right, so you'll see here, as far as a mom spreads, when an infected person coughs or sneezes, because where is this being affected? It's the salivary glands, right? And so if they cough or sneeze, what's gonna happen? The transmission uh, out into the air, right, um, will affect and can, you know, be transmitted to other people in the room and such. Mumps can spread before swollen glands appear and for five days afterwards. So that's a little scary also that having someone who's infected that you don't even know they're infected. But this is many times a presentation of a virus that you can be asymptomatic and still spread the virus. And here I would like to, uh, I'll show you as far as we looked at common cold um, and hepatitis, again, another type of um, virus that affects the liver, and uh, some can be cured, some not. Uh, polio, um, rabies, let's look at this as far as polio is concerned. So polio affects as far as the musculature, musculature is concerned. So paralysis, you're familiar with, or you might have heard polio, you think you associate it with paralysis. So polio virus destroys nerve cells in the spinal cord, right? Uh, causing muscle wasting and paralysis. And what you'll see here is that the polio virus this is the uh, multipolar neuron. And then you'll see here the axon going to the neuromuscular junction of the musculature. What goes on is that uh, the virus will infect the uh, nerve cell body and in particular affect how the transmission of nerve flow to the musculature allowing for uh, the ability to it, for it to be able to contract uh, takes place. So po paralytic uh, polio can lead to loss of reflexes, because affecting the nervous system, severe uh, muscle aches or weakness, loss, loose and floppy limbs, call that flaccid paralysis. So really the ability to like not really function as far as uh, with for someone with suffering with polio will permanently damage the, especially the extremities, the lower extremities and prevent them from allowing. So I've had patients, uh, older patient in particular, I'm thinking of one of my more recent patients prior to uh, retiring. She had a, a polio as a child, and so she had really um, the musculature of her lower extremities was quite damaged as a result, and so she walked with uh, crutches on both sides, right, uh, in order to be able to get around. So she was able to walk. Some end up um, not even being able to walk and being able to uh, uh, have to use a wheelchair and such. So it can be quite, quite catastrophic out outcome. So rabies, so let's, I think we're gonna end with rabies today, okay? 
So rabies is the fact. So viral, trans, it's a virus, the transmission, uh, primarily the vector would be, uh, uh, look at this, 99% of human cases are caused by dog bites. I, I never knew that it was that high, to be honest. I thought, well, you know, there's got to be issues. I, I think I shared with you all my, my three of my four children, um, going back a few years ago, were exposed to a, a bat in my home that was uh, that we ended up finding out a few days later after being tested was uh, the bat was uh, positive for rabies. We don't know if the, if my uh, children had gotten bit at all. Uh, know that bats have very very fine um, teeth, and so that you can get bit and not even know that you were bit. And so that could be transmitted. Look at you see here the saliva of infected animals. So whether it's a bat, whether it's a dog, whether it's a raccoon, whether it's a skunk, they all can transmit this. Um, now know that um, possums, uh, for whatever reason, I, and I have to look this up. I, by the next time I see that, I'll, I'll look this up. Why a possum does not get rabies has some type of natural immunity. I'll, I'll verify that, but I'm almost positive they do. Okay. Um, so treatment, washing of the wound with soap and vaccine injections can avoid symptoms and save lives. Know that once the symptoms present for the person that's been bit, um, there's a very high risk that they'll die as a result. Um, I'll show you that in just a moment here, but that's very sad. Seek immediate medical care. So what happened was that we, I took my, my, my children, the three of them uh, that were exposed to uh, the emergency room that night and we ended up getting uh, they ended up getting the vaccine as well as a serum so the vaccine will work at um, boosting allowing your immune system to create a specific defense towards the vaccine towards whatever it is that you're receiving right a um, a blood product which would be a serum would contain already created antibodies that have been created somewhere else right and then inject it into you. So that's a blood product that's injected to you. So there's risks involved with receiving a blood product like that, right? But what happens with that blood product that's that has the serum, that has those already created antibodies, your body can immediately start fighting if there's any virus present within your body. Um, so uh, that's what we had done. So they had multiple shots. We had to go back for boosters within, I forget, within a few days or a week. It's been so long, I don't remember, but you know, thank God they they we went for that because again, within a few days, we found out that the bat tested positive for rabies. So that was some scary stuff. Look, look at this image. So here, look, I'll show you this and then this. Yeah, now I have it. Hold on, folks. Let me just look and see. Oh, okay, it's here. Here we go. This is what I wanted to show you. So this is on WebMD, right? So viruses, uh, rabies is a virus that attacks the central nervous system and found only in mammals. Human cases, this is what I wanted to show you. Human cases of the virus are extremely rare in the United States, but if it's not treated before symptoms appear, it's deadly. Rabies has the highest mortality rate, 99.9% .9 of any disease on earth. So in other words, that this will kill you if you allow for the symptoms to present and do not get treatment prior to that, the chances of you dying as a result are extremely high, right? So the key is to get treated right away if you think you've been exposed to an animal that had rabies. So I didn't, we didn't know that my, my children had gotten bitten or not, but we just pre proactively went to the hospital and got, had them vaccinated and, and given the serum just to make sure that things were okay for them. You know, better to be safe than sorry, so to speak, right? Um, so we'll end with this slide right here for today and just show you that. So the virus enters via the animal bite, okay? So it bites the human replicates in the muscle at the site of the bite. So it's in the saliva, bites the, the patient, the person here. Um, the saliva uh, via the, the virus, via the saliva enters into the muscle. Um, the virus infects the nerve in the peripheral nervous system, moves by a retrograde transport, meaning that this, see right here, right? We have, here we go. So retrograde means that it's gonna go, the transport, will go this direction. So here's the, the neuron. So we're going from the muscle, it's going to transport, axonal transport to the nerve cell body. Yeah, <laughs> Kelly, thank you. Yeah, opossums are cool. <laughs> I think they're neat looking. And so enter into then 
the, the neuron cell body here, okay? And then what'll happen is it's a virus, right? So it's going to then uh, hijack the neuron cell and allow for replication of the, the virus. So infects the, the peripheral nervous system, right? Virus replicates in the dorsal root ganglion, right? That would be that posterior aspect of, just like where I showed you, uh, the dorsal root ganglion was where uh, the uh, varicella, the shingles, the uh, chicken pox virus, that's where it lays dormant. Travels up the spinal cord to the brain. Uh, the brain is infected, that's an encephalitis. Tra the virus travels from the brain via nerves to other tissues, such as the eye, kidneys, salivary glands, and this leads to a systemic infection, and this will lead to death, more than likely, right? And uh, and one more thing too, just to give you some insight that I didn't understand. There's this uh, fear of water, right? Uh, as a result of the infection. And so what goes on with this is that it's kind of a weird kind of a thing, right? That they would fear water as a result of being infected with the uh, rabies virus. Well, what takes place is that, understand that what is the mode of transmission? Saliva, right? And a bite. So the virus, we would say, has uh, evolutionary adaptation in such a way that it causes the brain to not want to, to be afraid of the water so that you don't drink water, because why would that be a problem for the virus? Well, if you drink water, what can that do to the virus that's present in your saliva? It can dilute it and make the transmission of the virus from bite to another uh, host, from the host to a victim, um, it can affect the transmission of the virus. So I thought that was very interesting to, to realize that as a result of adaptation and such, there's uh, issues as far as with um, this fear of water when uh, suffering from uh, rabies virus. All right, folks, so we're going to, let's see here, stop recording.